morning. My name is uh, Pedro Arduino, and I have a, 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 a small project with Pierre on the implementation and validation of the so-called pm 4 san that uh, John Bray was talking, talking about. So I have done this study together with my student, Long Cheng, and um, so who did most of, most of the work. So the, the objective was to implement this model uh, uh, in OpenSys and also validate uh, it using uh, some experimental results, uh, including soil element tests and also centrifuge tests. And if possible, compare with some, uh, some commercial tools that are available that also include this constitutive model, like uh, plug uh, and plugs. So pm for sun is, is a 2D model that has been proposed by Katerina uh, Ciotopoulou and Ross Boulanger. And uh, actually it follows a, a very uh, well-known framework that I call the Mansari da Fallas, it's a Fallias framework, that is based on what is called uh, bounding surface uh, plasticity. The interesting thing is that it has only three in, uh, primary parameters that you have to calibrate for. Is the relative density one, uh, the shear modulus or shear wave velocity at a location, and then a contraction rate parameter. So if you know these parameters, then there are other 24 additional parameters. Where, but the authors, what they have done, the authors meaning uh, Ross and Katerina, they have calibrated them for general soil conditions. So then you have to just calibrate the tree that you have there to represent your particular soil. It's basically a more Coulomb model, really, when you look at it in the QP space. And actually, if you look in a deviatoric space, it looks like this. It includes what is called a critical, uh, a critical, let me see what is the, the point here? A critical state line here, but oh, that is a more Coulomb uh, line. And that includes a dilation and a bounding surface, uh, bounding surface line there. Uh, is based, in order to define the uh, bounding surface uh, and the dilation surface, it uses what is called uh, the critical state line uh, for the soil. And in this particular model, instead of using this relationship for the critical state line, they use a relative density line and a concept based on a, a idea from uh, Ben and Jeffries that look at what is the relative density of the soil with respect to a critical value. And based on that, they can uh, identify the location of the bounding surface and the dilation surface. Both lines will converge to a critical line in a, a critical situation. So this is the basic model, and it's actually the basic of bounding surface and modeling. And it includes a non-associative flow rule. That means that if this is the normal to a yield surface, then uh, the flow follows a direction that is different. So there is a component there that is associated with the volumetric change, and the volumetric change depends on a parameter d. And that's the main thing of the model, how to account for this parameter d that includes contraction and dilation for the model. And for that, you use what is called kinematic hardening. So I won't, I won't go too much into the details, but the kinematic hardening will depend on some other parameters that you need, and in particular is going to look at the distance between what we call the back stress in one position to image points in the bounding, in the bounding surface. So that's all I want to say about, about the model that uh, was developed. So um, what we did is to implement this uh, in a framework that is very similar to OpenSys, and we started to do element tests. When I say element test, I mean that I am modeling a Gauss point. I don't have this in open seas. This is outside open, open seas. It's like having an engine testing facility where I test my constitutive model that is exactly the same as the one that is going to be in open seas a little bit later. So for that, I use what is called a mixed driver, a mixed driver constitutive uh, tool that I use. That is allowing me to input the stress path or the strain history that I want to, to use to test the model. And with that, I started with a, the, with a monotonic test. So monotonic test for different relative densities and different confining pressures. And what I see, you see here are comparisons with another version of this engine, constitutive model, that was implemented in FLAC. So and you see that we are more or less capturing the same, uh, the same thing. Then we did some cyclic tests. And uh, we were looking at number of cycles uh, to reach a 3% uh, 
uh, shear deformation. And again, comparison looks good until you start having many cycles. And then we started to have some problems. We have to go back and forth with some of the parameters. So if you calibrate some of the parameters, then you can start matching what you see in flag and what you see in, uh, in this constitutive mode. So once we had some confidence that the model was good, we started to do some more analysis where we did a lot of these cyclic tests. And we were counting the number of cycles that were needed to reach liquefaction for different cyclic stress ratios. And in particular, we're looking at what is called the effect of the K sigma, which actually means the effect of the overburden. The, and we were comparing FLAC and open seas. And then we were also looking at the effect of the K alpha, which actually means the uh, effect of having different initial shear stresses in the system. And you see that the results are not exactly the same. These are two very different implementations. So you don't expect things to be exactly, particularly when you are pushing the model with a kind of a, a extreme situations. We were more or less happy with this element level implementation. And so we said, well, can we go now to open seas? I said, well, let's put it in open seas. We put the engine into our Tesla. And once we were there, we said, let's do some simple analysis, one element. One single element. Now, it's difficult here because now you have to apply a phase to account for consolidation and another phase to apply the shear. Something that in my constituted driver I can do very simple. Here is a little bit more difficult. And we were, what we were doing is to compare what we get from the finite element to what we were obtaining with the mixed driver. And we were more or less happy with what we were. So that means that open seas, the engine in open seas is working more or less okay. And we did many more analysis considering many more cycles so that we were matched, to see that we were matching the results. After that, we said, why don't we do 1D analysis? Uh, we were considering different cases. We said, well, why don't we generate a series of synthetic soil profiles? So what you have here are different profiles for different N160s, or different relative densities. So N160 equal to 5, loose material, 10, and 20, 24, a stiffer or a denser material. And then we were looking at three different thicknesses of the liquefied layer, 3 meters or 6 meters. Above that, we had a 2 meters of uh, unliquefied soil or dry soil, and then we had a little base here for a linear elastic material. So uh, with that, we did a series of analysis considering different motions. So we chose three motions, Gilroy, a Northridge motion, and a chi uh, type uh, motion. What we were looking here is at different peak uh, accelerations and also some different durations. So now we have a series of soil profiles. We have a series of relative densities and thicknesses, we have a little bit of uh, a, a parametric analysis that we can do. And so the first thing we said, okay, okay, okay. This is my schematic of the model. This is my finite element uh, representation in open seas. Why don't, how do we model this? Well, we were using certain elements that are available in open seas, in particular, the stabilized single point uh, quad that uses a UP formulation to account for the couple response between the pore water pressure and the soil and boundary conditions and so forth. And before we did anything, we verified that we were obtaining a good response from this 1D uh, representation of the soil. What does it mean verify? Well, we put a very weak motion, very weak, 0.02 Gs. So by then, these should behave elastically. So then we can compare with shake, maybe deep soil, with the same motion. And then we say, well, okay, that would be enough. No, why don't we go to other tools? Why don't we look at plaxis, for example? And why don't we look at flak? And if they all are using the same model at the elastic level, they should all show the same type of response. That is what you would observe in pro-shape and deep soil. Notice that the meshes are all different here. So it's very difficult to compare different tools that they use different uh, models, different elements, different ways to apply damping, different ways to apply the input motion, and so forth. So this is what we obtained for that motion that was very weak, 0.02. This is the response spectrum at the top. And what you say is that the responses in terms of the PGA, 
the gamma max profile, and also the uh, cyclic stress ratios, they were all more or less the same. That means that the elements are working. Now, this is for a very weak motion. We are not engaging liquefaction at all here. That is giving me confidence about the discretization that I am using. So with that, we went to the motions. So N5, me, 5 means the uh, N160 equal to 5. 3 means a thickness of the liquefiable layer, 3 meters, and motion 1. So I will be showing you a cataract of results. So a lot of results in a couple of minutes, but they are all the same. They are all showing the motion here, then the response at the surface here in terms of the motion, a close-up of the acceleration time history, then the area's intensity uh, development, and then the response spectrum there, and then profiles of what? Peak ground acceleration, maximum shear uh, strain, then a maximum displacement, cycle stress ratio, and the uh, maximum uh, pore water pressure ratio. And you have three curves here. One corresponds to open seas, the blue, the other one corresponds to uh, flag, and the other one corresponds to plaxis. So we are trying to verify and validate that the model works more or the same. So when you have uh, uh, cyclic stress, stress ratios close to one, you should be getting some liquefaction in the system. So motion one, motion two, motion three. Very different motions, very different responses. But what you see is that the models are working more or less okay, and they're doing more or less the same thing. Difference here, well, of course, the elements are not exactly the same. We cannot capture the same. What happens if you have a thicker layer, motion one, motion two, motion three? Motion one, motion two, motion three. And then what happens with uh, N160 equal to uh, 10? Then we did most, uh, with, uh, 10, and then at the end, uh, let me go fast on, the, on those with N160 equal to 20 for different, uh, for different thicknesses of the, of the soil. So that gave us a confidence that in 1D is working. What happens if you include a little bit of a slope? So just include a slope here. How to do that? Well, just modify the gravity so that you have a component in that direction. How does the model behave? We did the same thing, motion one, motion two, and motion three. Now we only have results for flux, and we also have results for open seas. Plaxis, we don't have the results yet. And this is one of the things that peer may, can, may, may do to engage industry, maybe plaxis, so that maybe they want to they wanna cooperate with this. And they are interested in doing things like that. We have been going into a 2D case. This is, uh, for this, we have been looking at experimental results from a project that is called LEAP, funded by the National Science Foundation. Again, difficult to model exactly the boundary conditions, and also difficult to model the damping a characteristic of the system. And what we did is now calibrate the parameters, the three parameters that I mentioned, for experimental results that were done in a triaxial uh, test. So these are the three parameters, and we had to play with a couple of all the others that correspond to the 24 other parameters that are optional. And what you see here are just acceleration response spectra at the bottom and maybe at the surface, comparisons between what was recorded in 10 different centrifuge tests. 10 different centrifuge tests. So it's not so bad. You may think that it's bad, but when you start comparing even experiments to experiments, you see a lot of variability. These are pore water pressure ratios, again, at the bottom and at the surface. And uh, these are lateral displacements, again, recorded at a point here. And finally, we have been working with the SIM Center. They have been developing what is called a certain quantification FEM tool. What we did is to include our mixed driver. So we have the mixed driver there, then we can select the method that is going to be do, uh, used for uncertainty quantification, like the Latin hypercube uh, uh, sampling, number of samples, and the seed value that you have, and then what are the uh, variables that you, have, uh, you are going to be looking for the uncertainty, like N160, maybe H0, and maybe the shear modulus, <coughs> and we are running this in a stampede, number of processors that you can use, number of nodes that you want to use, and we are trying to look at some of the results that come from there. So I think this is my last uh, slide. And this, uh, in addition to this model, there is another version of the model called PM for silt. That seems to be the same model, but now for silts. 
that we have been implemented also in OpenSeas, and we are looking at some of the results. So with that, I think that I am done. I have a so so the constitutive model is a is a local model or non-local model? It, it, do you local from the so you do a point-wise testing of the model mm -hmm. with that mixed drive? Yes. So, so, so it doesn't have the feature of a non-local model that may model a damage in like no. what we no, call damage no, no, mechanics. No. Yeah, no, no, just, yeah, from the low, no local model, no, 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 doesn't include the damage. No. Because the parameters uh, doesn't include the mesh no. size, doesn't include the element size, no. none of this. No, it's a, it's no, it's a continuum based basic model. My model. Yes. And it's, uh, so as soon as you have damage, uh, uh, you may claim that the model uh, is not valid anymore. Like most constitutive models suffer the same thing. And, uh, so did you test it for a larger mesh, and, uh, oh, yeah. more than just yeah. one element? And no, we did one element, yeah. and then we did millions of elements, and trying to see if we can reproduce a triaxial test. Yes, you do the same. And then you go to a 1D. <coughs> Because with the 1D model, what you are really modeling is the propagation of the wave. Mm -hmm. So in the, in, the, in the single element, you model the constitutive behavior. So it is non-objective, basically. That's what you're trying to say. That it's mesh dependent, right? So if you have softening for any kind of material, yeah. which you do. Well, that, that, OK, you are going, this is mechanics. This, this, these guys are talking mechanics. <laughs> and yes. We are doing danger. We are doing, no, we are no, doing no, no, danger. no danger. It's, it's very correct. What you're saying is correct. But remember that all models are wrong. Some of them are more useful than others. And that's what happens here, too. So we have been trying to develop a model that captures the characteristics of the observed, the observed behavior. It has all the limitations that you mentioned, like all the others. You cannot say the same for a steel model. Sure, you sure. can say for a, so you have to go to non-local theories in sure. order to account for that. But I, I believe the Fallius model had some kind of a non-local parameter. I may be wrong. There are some. I, I looked yes. at it long time. Yeah, no, there are. No, there are. Well, but they, they don't go beyond very simple uh, uh, scenarios. As soon as you go to a scenario like this, pff, it's impossible. Yes. Um, <clears throat> just a remark on what Pavel just said. I thought his model indeed had this texture parameter which provided some non-locality anyway. But my question is about a comment you made earlier. You said this is all for like small deformation yeah. theory. So how do you, where's the boundary in that? If you implement, for example, an updated Lagrangian, would that be enough? Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, you yes. formulate the entire plasticity between Decom you know, this is an additive decomposition of the total strain. Yeah, right? uh, for the updated Lagrangian is for the mesh in, 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 in particular. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the theory, the constitutive model, can be extended to large deformation. It's not that difficult. If you make one assumption, isotropy. If you have isotropy, you can extend all these models to large deformations. The behavior is anisotropic. <laughs> That's the first thing that I find. So even when people tell you, and you will find people tell you, no, we are doing this in the larger formation. Ah, you are assuming isotropy immediately. Uh, I don't believe that you have. Uh, so yes, it's another, it's another, it's a, it's a problem. 